uh, the Director of Communications and Outreach at Maine Woodland Owners. I am um, thrilled to be able to have these types of meetings, events. Um, this is uh, my fifth one since we've been in our um, socially distancing phase of our organization. Uh, this has been uh, a new adventure for us as an organization because we are normally in the woods or in, um, in offices, uh, you know, or meeting rooms, having these uh, very rich discussions about issues that um, mean are important to our woodland owners. And we were a little concerned we weren't going to be able to reach out and be in touch with our members once we knew we couldn't have in-person presentations. But here we are uh, virtually. And so far, so good. I've, I've been getting good responses from participants. And uh, I have been really lucky to have wonderful people willing to um, share their expertise and their knowledge with our, with our members and the members of the public about issues that matter for Woodlands. And Mike Paricio is, is no different. We're really lucky to have him. He is the, he's a forest entomologist with the Maine Forest Service. And he is here to tell us uh, about the latest and greatest on invasive pests here in, in Maine. Um, he is actually, re, you know, I don't know if you can say replaced, but certainly took the position that Allison Canote had at one point uh, a year ago. Um, He's, he was just saying that he's hitting his uh, one year anniversary in his role. Uh, he came from Vermont and uh, he served as a forest health specialist for the Vermont Department of Forest, Parks and Recreation. And then before that, he was a forest health specialist for the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources in Minnesota. Um, so he has experience with many of the insects pests affecting Northeastern forests. Unfortunately, pests don't know political boundaries, so they do seem to make it over, over the, the line. And so, you, Mike, you're seeing the, some of the same things you saw in the other states that you worked in. So um, that is a, that's a good perspective for this. Um, just so everybody knows, I'm actually, Mike, I hadn't asked you, but I'm assuming you're willing, you're in, you're willing to take questions throughout your presentation, or do you have a preference? Would you like to have questions held? until you uh, take a break and then have people ask or what's your how would you like to go about questions? It looks like a pretty small group so because of that I'm fine to take questions uh, during the presentation um, that's no problem. So there's a couple ways that can mm -hmm. that can happen as everybody's uh, a lot of people have already used the chat that's a great way to send a question <clears throat> I'm going to keep an eye on the chat so and Mike you can as well if you see a question that you want to answer go for it if, if um, I see something and you might not have kept, caught it. I'll let you know that there's a question and I'll read it. Um, yeah, there's also please. there's also a raised hand or raise hand feature, <clears throat> which is underneath the um, participant list on the right side of your screen. And you click on that and then you can um, I'll see that and we'll uh, give you a chance to speak verbally, ask your question verbally if you'd like, which sometimes is a little nicer because then there can be a little bit of back and forth between Mike and the questioner. Um, Mike, I think, is going to be sharing his screen with, uh, he's going to have a few slides for everybody to see as well. Um, and I don't know, we'll talk about this after, but um, Mike, if you wanted to send me the slideshow, I can also have that posted with this video once, uh, once we're done and I'll have the recording. It will be up on, on the web and uh, so will the presentation if we feel like that's necessary. So I want to make sure everybody has the resources after this meeting's over. Um, have I missed anything? Anybody have any questions before I let Mike go ahead? We're going to go until 530. Um, however, if things get too exciting and people need to stay and ask more questions, Mike, would you be able to give us oh, a yeah. few extra? Yeah, happy to stay as, as long as it takes. Terrific. Yeah, I, I think we'll have a lot of uh, good questions today. So, and we're looking, looking forward to your presentation. Thank you very much. And so, and, and now uh, the floor is yours. Okay, thanks for that introduction, Jen. And thanks everybody for tuning in. Um, I must say I'm new to this whole virtual presentation thing myself. So please be patient with me as I inevitably bumble through some of these controls. But um, for time being, I'm gonna stop my video and share my screen. So if somebody would please consider
confirm for me that you guys can uh, see the screen I'm sharing. I, I can see it, Mike. That makes a difference. And then anybody else? Yeah, Richard, I can see it. Movement of force products. Great. Whoops, that's the second slide, sorry. Now you got a sneak peek, but anyways, okay, here we go. So again, yeah, thanks for tuning in everybody. Uh, Mike Parisio here with the Maine Forest Service. Um, and yeah, this is a great uh, opportunity to do some of these uh, virtual forestry info sessions online at a time when we can't really uh, get together and do these presentations in person. But um, yeah, I'm here today to give you an update on uh, some of the findings and observations we made involving uh, invasive forest pests in, in 2019 and as we head into the upcoming field season here in, uh, in 2020, um, which is rapidly approaching. So um, at several points during this presentation, um, I'm gonna give you an update on changes to the boundaries of a quarantine zone. So we have six quarantined uh, pests here in Maine um, with quarantine regulations associated with them. And so I'll talk about some of those, but uh, I figured I'd start with just a, a quick primer on forestry quarantines for those that might not be totally familiar with them, uh, just so you have a better idea of what I'm talking about when I go over those. So uh, basically, um, when we have invasive pests, a lot of times if they're serious enough, they receive uh, quarantine regulations associated with them. Um, and basically what that quarantine does is it gives us a way to control uh, the movement of regulated materials. So uh, when we're talking about forest pests, you know, we can, we can think of regulated materials, for example, like infested uh, wood materials and things like that, but also um, potentially infested things and things with a higher potential to, to be infested. So not necessarily always known. Um, and that's what we see with a lot of these forest pests is that they're very difficult to, uh, to detect and, and know where they are. So hence the reason for our quarantine. So uh, before these things arrive on the scene, you know, we can basically think of everything as a non-quarantine area. So that's basically business as usual. So if you're moving, you know, wood products in a non-quarantine area, uh, you can do that freely, um, you know, move stuff from point A to point B in a non-quarantine area. Um, when we have an invasive pest um, arrive on the scene that receives a quarantine uh, regulation, then, you know, we set up a quarantine area and that's basically, you know, what we know, but also some of what we don't know. So what we know is maybe a core detection or uh, infestation area, but there's also, you know, what we kind of refer to as a buffer area around that. So areas that, you know, very well could have populations of an invasive insect, but we're just not sure because we haven't detected it yet. So uh, um, I just want to point out that these quarantine areas are not um, all fully um, affected by an invasive pest or something like that. They include a lot of non-affected area as a protective buffer um, for movement of materials. So um, we do classify them as the same kind of areas. So again, you know, once we have a regulated material, you can move it from point A to point B within a quarantine area. And obviously you can bring stuff from a non-quarantine area that's presumed to be non-affected or non-infested into a quarantine area where you can assume there's a high probability of things being infected. But you can also bring it out, but it's not so easy. So that's where we encounter the red tape is when we're trying to take things from a quarantine area and move it um, either into a non-quarantine area or through a non-quarantine area. So. Um, and that's where, you know, we come in with our oversight to make sure that this stuff is happening um, safely and effectively. So um, all of that is regulated and we can safely move uh, regulated materials into non-quarantine areas under certain conditions. So we regulate that with things like limited permits and compliance agreements. So um, basically compliance agreements are set up with receivers and those receivers have an understanding and, you know, a set of agreements um, that we come to. Uh, to, to um, determine how that regulated material is going to be handled, moved, and treated and disposed of properly. So once we get those things in effect, we can basically think of receiving facilities, you know, think of a mill, for example, as a mini quarantine area. And we can bring stuff safely into those areas with the understanding that they're going to be treated in a way way that's not going to allow for the spread of an invasive uh, insect or other forest pests within that non-quarantine area. And then obviously uh, we can't allow movement of regulated items into areas that don't have that agreement. So facilities that don't have such a compliance agreement set up um, just aren't uh, equipped to, to bring in 
regulated materials safely and so we don't permit for that so so that's a basic uh, outline of how our forestry quarantines work here and with that I'll jump into talking about um, uh, quarantine pests that's you know front and foremost on most people's radar um, today and this is a really good time to be doing this presentation here in, in early May as we launch into uh, what's already the regulatory flight season for emerald ash borer so that lasts from May to September and that's when uh, the insect has a higher probability of being active and dispersing so that begins May 1st here so that's when we really cramp down on our uh, allowed movements of regulated materials um, and ash products and things like that. So um, I'll start on the life cycle here where we are. So right now, basically, I, early I, this is Richard. I asked a question about a little bit. Uh, we've got some, I have a live in Acton. We're definitely in, in the town in an area that's quarantined for, for ash. We've got yeah. some really big piles of firewood ready to go. Uh, they're monster. Beautiful piles of fire, but how is the department going to deal with that? I mean, they're going, they're moving around in small, relatively small trucks. There, this stuff isn't going to a mill; it's going to somebody's house. And we're around, right on the border, so we have stuff going back and forth between New Hampshire and Maine. What do you do with firewood? Um. Well, that's interesting. I, I guess I'll handle the first. You know, we we do have some firewood dealers that are you know, under compliance agreements to make sure that their stuff is sourced um, in Maine and staying within Maine, either within a quarantine area or a non-quarantine area. As far as back and forth movement between New Hampshire and Maine, both of our states have exterior hardwood firewood uh, quarantines. So New Hampshire doesn't allow anything in uh, without a compliance agreement and same for Maine, you know, and that only happens in a couple very rare um, situations here. For the most part, that's totally forbidden. So um, I'd be interested to know more about that in case there's some unregulated movement going on that we're not aware of. Um, I, just, I see the, the wood before it's processed. It's a mix. It's typical for what you know goes into firewood. And then I see the huge piles of stuff that's been processed and ready to be shipped. And I can't imagine from a regulatory standpoint how you how you can do anything about that. Yeah, well, that's why firewood is the number one culture. I mean, legally, as long as it's, you know, staying within the quarantine zone, it can be distributed freely like that. Um, we don't prefer that. You know, we have best management practices that we try to uh, encourage in order to discourage that type of movement. But from a legal perspective, that is uh, that is fair game, unfortunately. So, uh, like I say, you know, our best management practices, we really encourage the use of local firewood. Um, and not transporting it. And, um, you know, some, some firewood uh, dealers are equipped for heat treatment. So once uh, uh, firewood's been heat treated to the proper certification, then it can be, you know, moved freely, you know, even out of a quarantine zone. So uh, I'm not sure if that could be the situation going on there. It doesn't sound like it, but that would be uh, favorable, so. Thank you. Yep, so. But um, yeah, unfortunately, yeah, we'll learn more that firewood is a, a very serious vector of forest pests and especially EAB. But um, yeah, at this point in the, the year here, um, adults beneath the bark are, are in the pupil stage. They're getting ready to emerge actively here. So they'll emerge and you all have probably heard of their characteristic uh, D-shaped exit holes. So that's something to be on the look for. Um, but then, yeah, once the adults emerge here um, in late May, early June, Basically, they have to undergo a couple of weeks of maturation feeding, and then they mate, and then it takes another couple of weeks until they're laying eggs. And uh, uh, female EAB are pretty productive there. You can see there's an average of 40 to 70 eggs. Um, again, that's on average. Some uh, very productive females lay, you know, upwards of over 100 eggs, but um, still a uh, very um, significant spread potential there. And um, this illustration doesn't show it well, but those 40 to 70 eggs are usually widely distributed in groups of just one, two, or three, or a couple, and uh, uh, over a wide, um, wide area. So after those eggs hatch, the neonate larvae tunnel into the, uh, the flow of material right below the bark there where they feed. And I'll share with you some pictures of what that looks like here. So um, this is what we'll be uh, looking for early in the spring, and, and those of you that own woodlots here um, or spend a lot of time in the woods um, should always be on the lookout for stuff like this on ash. Um, but characteristic for emerald ash borer 
is the shape of their galleries. So we call them S-shaped or serpentine, however you like. But you can see a very neat pattern of back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And they start this pattern even at a very um, young life stage here. So even first instar larvae here are already doing that. Here you can see an entire complete gallery that's uh, been completed, you know, one through the fourth instar here um, and going into the wood to pupate there. So you can see the size of that. But again, you know, that very distinct serpentine back and forth, back and forth that can be confused with some of our native boars um, that do some similar stuff, but uh, usually pretty distinct. And if you have a couple pieces of evidence, you can be quite sure it's EAB. Um, again, here's some more examples. There's from the last slide there. So you can see that. In, uh, in perspective, but um, whether it's a narrow S or here's a, a wider S, um, but again, that back and forth, back and forth is very characteristic. And then here you can see, again, that S shape, and this is a complete gallery. That would be a mature fourth uh, instar larvae right there. Um, that's pretty distinctive for EAB, so you can see the abdominal segments are are bell-shaped there, and they also have these two little black appendages on the end of their uh, their hind end there that other native boars don't have, so really a telltale giveaway. And here you can even see another small gallery that uh, was unsuccessful right next to it where that larva died in there. So um, yeah, again, once you take back the, uh, the bark of um, an infested tree, this is what you're going to be looking for if you're looking for EAB. And the, uh, the infestation power of these uh, insects is pretty phenomenal. These are pictures from uh, Western New York I took years ago, but um, absolutely, you know, incredible how many larvae can uh, uh, populate a single tree here. <clears throat> and uh, you can see my hand there for scale, you know, both these trees large and not a, uh, not a square centimeter of flow of material left in them from where those uh, EAB have uh, consumed it all. And here's a good picture. It's a little out of focus for some reason on the presentation here, it looks like. But anyways, um, we're always talking about woodpecker damage and how that's one of the most useful detection tools. So now's a really good time and, and late winter, early spring before leaf out to be looking for that woodpecker damage. So you can see what the woodpeckers are after here with the side by side of what's going on beneath the, uh, the bark there. And uh, they're going around and extracting those larvae from the bark. So pretty dramatic, but again, yeah, woodpecker damage, a really uh, reliable um, detection tool, or at least uh, something that piques our interest and gets us to have a closer look. Um, so um, we can talk a little bit about the history of emerald ash borer in the United States and how that relates to quarantine. So it's a federally quarantined insect as well. Um, unfortunately, that federal quarantine has been relatively unsuccessful here since its introduction in 2002 to, uh, to Southern Michigan, the greater Detroit area, and just across the, uh, the way there in Ontario. So um, yeah, unfortunately a very difficult insect to, uh, to detect because of those uh, life stages taking place beneath the bark there. So uh, it's allowed it to spread um, pretty much throughout uh, most of the native range of, of our ashes here in Eastern North America there. So at this point, the Valley, you know, totals up to 36 U.S. states and now five Canadian provinces there. So uh, Maine was a holdout for a long time, but as of uh, 2019, now Maine is on the board with a couple of uh, infestation uh, locations here, unfortunately. <clears throat> so, yeah, going back to firewood and, and other wood products, um, you know, we know that EAB naturally only spreads at a rate of about one to two miles a year. So if you look at that last map, you might be thinking to yourself, what's going on there? But basically, this is a story of human-aided movement. So, um, you know, I had this slide in another presentation I was giving up towards Madawaska. But um, basically, if you do the math there, you know, you're looking at 900, 1,000 miles from, you know, that original infestation point to Madawaska, or about 800 miles to Portland, you know, where we now know it is. So... Uh, you know, if, if it was allowed to spread naturally, we wouldn't be having this talk for a couple hundred years. But here we are today, just uh, less than 20 years later, looking at the uh, basically the conquest of eastern North America by emerald ash borer through human uh, facilitated movement. So something to keep in mind, you know, we can uh, really influence the trajectory or the remaining trajectory of uh, the EAB infestation here in, in Maine. Um, I'll give you some of the most recent events, not that recent anymore. Like I said, a lot of these observations go back to uh, 
2019 here, but um, the last major find we had was in October of 2019, uh, where we discovered um, a beetle on a purple prism trap in Portland. So you can see that beetle at right. That's the same beetle. I know they're different sizes, it's just two different uh, shots of them, but that's the actual beetle. So uh, that was a lot of excitement. Um, up until then, York County had been the, uh, the boundary of the quarantine zone. Um, but that find prompted the addition of uh, 13 towns in Cumberland County to an emergency order status. So that basically has all the same regulations as a, uh, a quarantine. It's just not uh, fully in, into law at that point. So um, again, in October 25th, immediately after that find, we uh, um, applied those regulations to that emergency order there. And then we continue to do delimitation surveys throughout 2020 doing a lot of branch sampling in uh, Portland, the city proper and surrounding areas, but we have not found any additional uh, infested trees um, in near proximity to that positive trap uh, at this point. So um, in, in terms of other monitoring activities, we also uh, operate a network of girdled trap trees um, throughout the, uh, the quarantine areas and throughout the state actually. So what that does, uh, uh, the whole program involves physically injuring um, a small ash tree by removing a, a girdle or a, a strip of bark from around the circumference there. And that causes a change in the pheromones and the, uh, or the volatiles rather that the tree puts off that the insects are able to detect. And uh, it's been shown that they are preferentially attracted to, uh, to trees that have had that girdling treatment applied to them. So we use that as a detection tool. We girdle the trees in the spring allow them to be exposed to possible infestation by EAB throughout the growing season. Then we go back in the fall and we uh, process those trees by removing the outer bark, by peeling them with draw shaves uh, to see what's going on underneath and look for larvae basically. So um, from that last year, we did learn, um, you know, we knew we had EAB in towns like Acton, Lebanon and Berwick. So we uh, had girdled trap trees, so we, we reconfirmed, so to speak, the presence there by having more positive um, girdled trap trees around those original finds. And then we also learned of some new areas in Berwick, or uh, not Berwick, rather, Alfred Kittery and, and Lymington. And so um, we basically used that information to, to adjust the, uh, the quarantine boundaries here. So you can see in this uh, out-of-date map here, um, you know, there's that emergency order area that was added after that purple prism trap detection in Portland. And then following those other girdle trap tree detections, the addition of the rest of Cumberland County and the five southernmost towns in Oxford County to uh, that regulated area. So that was proposed, went out for uh, public comment, was uh, uh, no issues with that there. So that was adopted here in March. So this is what the, uh, the current quarantine boundaries <coughs> Um, look like in Maine. And again, this is part of the, uh, uh, also part of the federal quarantine boundaries extent in addition to the Maine state here. So this has um, the federal law associated with it as well. So you can see we have both corners of the state here, you know, northernmost um, uh, corner here up in Aristic County, you know, it's Eagle Lake Township. So north and east of that. And then, yeah, um, basically all of York, Cumberland and those five towns in Southern Oxford are, are included in the EAB quarantine zone now. Um, so what are we doing as EAB continues to, uh, to spread here? And uh, we don't have any serious damage yet, but it's coming. But uh, we're fortunate that we're one of the, the latter states to be infested because We've had a lot of time to learn and, and see what other states have done. So we're using every tool in the toolbox uh, that's out at our disposal right now to, to hopefully ease the, uh, the pain of, of the coming um, spread of EAB throughout the state. So we do have a biological control program going. So we're releasing parasitoids and I'll talk about those a little bit more in the upcoming slides, but we've released those in uh, Madawaska uh, all throughout 2019. Um, because of how populated um, the areas are near the southern uh, main infestations, we had kind of a hard time identifying good biocontrol sites there. So um, you need, you know, larger stands with high components of ash, um, particularly smaller ash, make the best uh, biocontrol release sites. But those just aren't readily available um, with uh, with permissions down there. So we have found some now. Um, so hopefully we'll get that program going in southern Maine as well in 2020 here. Um, 
We still continue to monitor with purple prison traps. So hopefully you guys have seen those um, out and about hanging in the trees, um, wherever you are. Uh, you won't see those in those quarantine areas anymore. They're, they're basically designed to work on detections outside of the quarantine zone. So um, yeah, we'll, we'll be readjusting the ones that were in those uh, quarantine zone additions uh, in 2020 here, hang them um, in the greater parts of the state there. We'll be kind of shifting our focus up towards um, around Bangor, Old Town and, and that area now that we have some traps which we need to move. Um, we have uh, Cerceris Biosurveillance. This is a really cool program. Cerceris is a, uh, uh, a native ground nesting wasp and they actually prey on uh, related um, metallic woodborne beetles to EAB. So they go out and hunt them and parasitize them and provision their, uh, their ground nests um, with these beetles as food for their larvae. So it uh, turns out um, once you bring EAB into an area because it's related to some of their native prey, um, they can actually you know, identify it and uh, they'll bring uh, EAB back to their nest just the same. So basically net them when they're approaching with the beetle and you can uh, determine what they've got. So a really cool way to, uh, to use a natural uh, control. And then, uh, like I mentioned before, we have our network of uh, girdle trap trees throughout the state. And uh, I think Jen will give that information at the end here. You can find it on our website. You know, if folks are interested in participating in that girdle trap tree network, um, we are always looking for volunteers um, to know where EAB is and is not. So, yeah, I'll talk real quick about uh, the biocontrol agents just because they're they're pretty interesting. So the first one is Oobius agrilli, and that's an egg parasitoid. So uh, it's amazing, you know, this is all happening on such a tiny scale. You know, these are EAB eggs, and they're about one millimeter in length. So here you can see female wasp um, ovipositing into an EAB egg. So they're you know able to find them, you know, in the environment. Um, but uh, here you can see some examples of lab reared um, oobius. So you can see the difference between, you know, these two healthy EAB eggs, you know, there's the head of the, the larvae and the, the hind end there. Then you can see, you know, imagine that little wasp there, you know, developing inside there. So those are the wasp larvae or pupae, they look like at that point, are uh, ready to emerge. So really fascinating stuff. Um, that's obvious agrilli. And then there's two larval parasitoids. So the first is Tetrasticus plantae panisi. Um, again, here you can see the female and um, really, really remarkable, you know, these tiny parasitoids are able to locate EAB larvae beneath the bark and um, position themselves above them. Here you can see the female ovipositor going into um, through the bark and into an EAB larvae, and these are endoparasitites. So the, uh, the wasp larvae, parasitoid larvae you see here have actually developed inside of the uh, EAB larvae and fully consumed it. So you can see, you know, whether you normally expect to find an EAB larvae, all you find are the, the remnants of the larvae and all these small wasp larvae that have successfully parasitized them. So these are things that can be uh, monitored in the field and recovered. But uh, Tetrasicus is really promising given just how many offspring it produces and uh, its success and ease of, uh, or relative ease of rearing in the lab. So uh, this is the one that gets released uh, by large. Um, so we're really hopeful that this will do good things for, uh, for EAB populations in Maine. And I should mention that, yeah, these aren't, uh, these biocontrols aren't anything that can really um, suppress the population to a, a point where it's not going to have effects. Um, they're kind of just a contributing factor. You know, if we use multiple management techniques, we can uh, kind of suppress the overall population, but they won't certainly eliminate emerald ash borer because it's the only thing they attack. Um, it obviously needs to be present in the environment before they're released. So, uh, they won't, uh, they won't be able to eliminate it ever. And then here is an example of a Spathius. So there's two species of these being released in the US. Uh, Spathius galenae is being released up here in Maine due to its better cold hardiness and the other species is now reserved for more Southern climes. But um, this is an ectoparasitoid. So you can see the EAB larvae there and then these Spathius larvae attached to the, uh, the outside of the EAB larvae. So again, pretty fascinating stuff that these uh, 
tiny wasps are able to find the EAB larvae and successfully parasitize them and kill them in the process. So here's just a collage again of some of those pictures. Um, again, here's, you know, this was recovered from a, a wild tree here. There's an EAB egg with, um, when Obius parasitizes them, they become discolored and dark like that. And you can see the exit hole on the top there where the, uh, the little wasp emerged rather than the uh, EAB emerging through the bottom and going into the, uh, the phloem there. So here's some pupated spathias. So these have completed their development inside those little paper um, cocoons there are, are young wasps uh, ready to uh, to emerge and, and continue the process and uh, yeah really really interesting stuff. Any questions on EAB before I switch over to uh, Hemlock Woolly Adelgid? Okay hearing none I'll, I'll keep moving or answer those at the end if anybody thinks of anything. So uh, here's another update. Um, we have expanded the Hemlock Woolly Adelgid quarantine as well. That hasn't been updated since I believe 2013. That was mostly concentrated um, around, you know, coastal southern Maine and uh, mid-coast Maine here. Um, so we've now extended it all the way up to the Washington County border. Um, you know, there's a lot of known populations throughout here. Most of these, you know, the, the real driver of this is, you know, an ornamental planting on Mount Desert Island that had hemlock woolly adelgid. Uh, and since then, um, hemlock woolly adelgids escaped into the environment and so um, again you know these quarantine areas don't, don't represent thorough infestation by forest pests but these are all the places where it's reasonable to, to believe that it could be um, established and because again you can see here it's a uh, tiny cryptic insect you know pretty hard to detect um, yeah we don't always uh, find it very easily uh, despite our best efforts to really do a lot of survey work but um yeah i even had a call from a gentleman this morning or emailed in a picture you know with a positive id so uh we do get a lot of assistance from the public and we we really appreciate that that's a huge help to uh, our work and knowing where where things are but um anyways yeah there's two parts of this quarantine so um it does regulate rooted seedlings so any live um hemlock is is in terms of quarantine regulations, that's all regulated by the horticulture program. And then anything relating to forestry products, um, you know, non-living materials and stuff, that's regulated by the main forest service here. So we kind of share those responsibilities with our, our horticulture program. So um, but anyways, those are the regulated items. So those are the things we try to uh, control movement of because the, uh, the tiny crawlers can be present, you know, if there's top material, uh, meaning needles or, or any small twigs present in uh, any of this compost material or, or, or anything like that. So um, yeah, because of its small size, very easy to spread. And if anybody listening, if uh, if you like feeding the birds, this is a tough time of year because we've had such a weird delayed spring and the birds are, are hurting for food and it's been cold. But um, yeah, um, if you stop feeding the birds uh, during the, the summer, late spring and summer months when food's more available, that's a good way to reduce the spread of uh, hemlock woolly adelgid because they are so tiny. You know, they do crawl onto uh, perching birds and uh, get distributed through by, by that way because birds tend to like uh, sheltered environments like conifers and hemlocks. So um, yeah, one, one thing we can all do to uh, kind of reduce that spread, but uh, obviously it spreads in other ways as well. Um, one more quarantine revision uh, that happened last year uh, was the change in the gypsy moth quarantine. So up until really 2019 here, you know, this orange area was outside of the quarantine zone. So through a lot of our monitoring work, you know, we've kind of figured out that there are um, populations of gypsy moth already in that, that area. So here's uh, trapping results from our actual gypsy moth survey targeting um, gypsy moth here as you can see you know quite a bit um, all throughout the north main woods here unfortunately so um, yeah and also through other trapping uh, programs our spruce budworm trap uh, network you know returns a lot of gypsy moth in the traps and our purple prison traps catch male gypsy moths all the time and stuff like that so unfortunately they're pretty well distributed throughout Maine so uh, yeah again now uh, those regulations apply to the whole state of Maine and, and regulated items can be moved more freely from point A to point B. <clears throat> okay, brown tail moth update. That's an exciting one. So uh, 
that people are pretty easily interested in. So don't have great information yet, but I'll, I'll tell you what I know. So um, basically there's, there's been a lot of uh, back to back years of, of quite a bit of uncomfortable activity in terms of brown tail moth. So we know that populations have been increasing since about 2015. Um, last year, we did see, you know, very localized, we did see some population collapses due, due to some entomopathogens. So there's uh, certain fungal diseases and viruses that attack brown tail moth and very similar uh, closely related um, caterpillars there. So that was fortunate. We did see some of that and that's aided by the weather. Um, but um, yeah, again, uh, not on a grand scale like you do see with gypsy moth sometimes. Um, but uh, yeah, that's what we're kind of hoping for. So we'll, we'll hope that those entomopathogens continue to uh, to proliferate uh, throughout all of the areas where brown tail moths are very active. Um, we do kind of two rounds of survey uh, for brown tail moth based on their uh, their life cycle or aerial survey at least. So we do a summer, early fall um, aerial survey, and uh, basically that late fall um, aerial survey takes a look at uh, the uh, the early instar larvae that are getting ready to overwinter. They do just a little bit of feeding to get to that uh, certain size that they overwinter in. So uh, compared to the, the previous year, it looks like that damage was down. So hopefully that's an indication of the overall population. And uh, yeah, um, we also, to do a lot of roadside surveys uh, to look for winter webs where they overwinter, um, and yeah, it's uh, it's kind of a crapshoot. It looks like it's moving around, so um, no real relief uh, in any particular area. It might be down in some, but then it's up in others. So uh, again, just something we're keeping an eye on, and, and people certainly let us know where they're seeing it, and it's pretty much everywhere. So um, here's the uh, the exposure risk. Um, that heading is not updated, that's for 2020. So this is the 2020 map, sorry about that. Um, so here you can see the risk map, again, the core area really being uh, the coastal areas, especially mid coast Maine here. So this is the real hot spot. But um, yeah, basically we've expanded our survey all throughout the, the coastal region uh, to down east out here um, to include some, some new categories of severity. So basically um, we have these two new codes on here, alert and trace, which if you've seen this map before, weren't on there last time. So trace, you know, is where we're finding small numbers of, uh, of webs. So obviously brown tail moth spreading um, throughout. And then alert areas. So these are areas where uh, um, nothing or very low amounts have been um, detected, but certainly high risk areas for, for future um, population by brown tail moth. And again, you know, this is a, uh, it's not a quarantine species, but um, like some of the quarantine species, excellent hitchhiker. Um, we've traced um, some satellite infestations to, uh, to human-aided movement. You know, they'll, they'll um, spend time on uh, mobile homes, boat trailers, things like that, RVs, um, while they're going through their uh, development there so they can inadvertently be transported far and wide pretty easily there. So. But yeah, it looks like it'll be another uh, potentially bad year um, for brown tail moth unless we get some relief from those uh, entomopathogens, hopefully. Um, winter moth, um, hopefully that's one I won't have to talk about for, for too much longer because we've got a really successful biological control program going for that. So uh, we do release the parasitoid flies as NS albicans. So this is, this is a pretty neat program. Um, this program has been going since 2013 now, and we've had, you know, like I mentioned, a great deal of success. So um, we've been recovering parasitized winter moth caterpillars uh, since 2016 now, pretty reliably at, at many of our release sites. And some of our more successful ones, those in Kittery and Cape Elizabeth, are seeing parasitism rates of 16 and 27 percent, respectively, which for a biocontrol program is pretty remarkable. So. Um, yeah, we just uh, went to check on these the other week. So uh, Booth Bay Harbor had the worst affiliation in 2019. So that's where we chose to do releases of these uh, parasitoid flies in 2020. So here's what it looks like. Um, the whole process is, is, is pretty interesting. We go out in the early spring and collect caterpillars, which we rear until they pupate. And we send them down to 
University of Massachusetts where they can determine whether or not the uh, pupated um, um, winter moth are parasitized or not, um, in which case they just send us the parasitized larvae uh, pupate back. Uh, we put them in these little emergence cages over the winter there, so they're exposed to uh, you know the, the climate. And then basically we go back in the spring and wait for them to start emerging. And once they do, we pop open these cages and let them continually emerge on their own. So uh, we had really good emergence in Booth Bay Harbor when we checked on it the other week. So uh, we're hoping that that will be a, another successful biocontrol site. So. All right, so I know this is an invasive um, species update. That's about it for the invasive species. I did want to sneak in some uh, some native species stuff, and I'd like to talk a little bit about spruce budworm um, in Maine here. So, and yeah, I can uh, I can see perhaps some some people on the on the conference here have uh, have experienced the the last outbreak here. So. Um, well, we'll start just with a little bit of background information. So despite the name, balsam fir is the preferred host, uh, not spruce, although it will readily attack spruce. Um, and spruce budworm is a native defoliator with these big periodic outbreaks that usually you know, occur anywhere from 30 to 60 years, but on average about 40 years. So we know right now we're really primed for, a, uh, for an outbreak and uh, things have been active. Um, we're getting more active in Maine since about 2013, although they have not exploded yet. So we're just kind of trying to keep an eye on that situation. So here you can see, you know, this is the culprit that does the real damage to the larvae that are voracious eaters in huge numbers uh, that do the real defoliation damage. But um, yeah, they'll be, uh, right now they're, they're still probably not emerged. Um, again, we've had a delayed cold spring, especially up north where they are most, um, Prevalent, so uh, but yeah, any 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 week now they'll probably start to uh, to begin their feeding um, throughout May and June, or maybe a little later this year. But um, yeah, adults will be flying usually by July. That's when the big flights are. Um, again, they'll complete their reproduction cycle, lay eggs, and then uh, overwinter as larvae, so they're ready to uh, get a jump on spring defoliation the following year. Um, and yeah, I want to give some historical background of what we're uh, what we're kind of worried about, um, why we're so interested in the populations right now. So, um, the last major outbreak spanned roughly from 1967 to 1993. Really exploded in the mid to late 70s there, and uh, you know that 1993 figure is a lot of the uh, the outfall from it. Um, but uh, this was a particularly large outbreak, you know, 136 million acres across Eastern Canada and Maine. So you can see the whole extent of this, uh, this last outbreak from start to finish. So huge scale. Um, for Maine, particularly, this was pretty devastating. You know, we had mortality rates for balsam fir reaching anywhere from 84 to 97% in areas for red spruce, you know, 30 to 66. So. Um, you know, in addition to being the preferred host, fir tends to fare worse uh, compared to red spruce, so a little bit more resilient, but still very susceptible. And overall, you know, we, we this resulted in an estimated 20 to 25 million cords of, of, of lost uh, volume there uh, due to spruce fir mortality. And in addition to that, hundreds of millions of, of dollars of revenue lost to the, the forest industry that's so important for for Maine and Northern Maine. So on the left here, we'll kind of sit on this slide and watch this kind of trickle through. So we've been monitoring spruce budworm for, for a very long time here. And uh, you know, here's um, static images of the, the last major outbreak, but we can watch it in real time here. So as you can see, there's, there's usually a bit of an endemic population, you know, um, so detectable amounts, you know, we still haven't seen any defoliation in Maine yet uh, during our aerial survey or on the ground surveys here. So we're kind of um, interested to see when that's going to start, um, perhaps even this year. But again, we've been we've been wrong in the past. It's been kind of predictable even, or unpredictable, even though we're expecting it. So here you can see where things are really going to get out of control here as we enter the, uh, the mid to late 70s. And there you have it.
So yeah, pretty dramatic, you know, in terms of scale and ability to spread and, you know, just shifting patterns of where the core uh, defoliation areas are. But um, yeah, definitely a, a very mobile forest pest. So, all right, we can see that. So um, yeah, we are worried about that, but fortunately there are some favorable differences between now and then. So in terms of the resource, you know, we're only dealing with only uh, 6 million acres of spruce fir in, in 2018 at the last time of uh, inventory there for this data uh, versus some 8 million cords in 1971. Um, today, 73 million cords versus 126 million cords in 1970. Um, that's not all merchantable, but we do have 27.3 million merchantable cords of, of, four, of fir in the forest right now. Um, uh, we do have a difference in the age demographics there. So um, today, most of that spruce fir is under 65 years old um, versus the last time spruce bloodworm populations were building. It was in that 46 to 100 years old range that's much more susceptible. Um, um, harvest is down. So, you know, we're looking at 1.5 to 2 million cords harvested in the past decade versus, um, you know, those, those previous decades where an average of 2 to 3 million cords um, were harvested. So, so it's become a less important part of the, uh, the forest economy, even though it's still a huge part. Um, again, fewer merchantable stands at risk in the modern situation here. And uh, fortunately, our monitoring capabilities and options for, for control have, have uh, well improved since then. So what's happening right now? Um, why are we paying attention to this? We know that there's, um, since this has all started, the modern outbreak in Canada that we're, uh, we're expecting outfall from, you know, about 20 million acres have already been affected throughout neighboring Quebec. So you can see um, just the, the sheer extent of this. This is a huge area uh, with uh, a lot of serious damage and, you know, damage in that moderate to severe category. So <clears throat> serious defoliation, lots of mortality. Um, Definitely something that, uh, you know, we're, we're worried about. But, um, you know, in terms of economics, again, it's a huge economic toll. You know, Quebec spent $33 million to control spruce budworm just last year. Um, we know now they're not going to be doing any control in 2020, so we're curious how that's going to, uh, to manifest. But um, anyways, like I mentioned, you know, we have 5.8 million acres right now, balsam fir or spruce fir forest, you know, with 27.3 million cores of merchantable fur, and that's what's at risk. So, um, yeah, and also a lot of activity building in New Brunswick. Um, they've done a lot of active management to keep those uh, building population centers, they call them hotspots suppressed. So, uh, yeah, we're really impressed with what they've done next door in, in New Brunswick. Um, uh, another th really interesting thing that comes out of uh, the Canadian researchers are these flight models. You know, um, big spruce budworm flights can be picked up on radar, you know, but they do a lot of these uh, really interesting models based on atmosphere conditions that really drive dispersal of um, spruce budworm. So most of the time, from a main standpoint, the wind patterns in 2019 were very favorable. So stuff was, was moving to the east and, and the northeast. Um, blowing out to uh, New Finland and stuff like that. So very unfortunate for those areas, but again, just solely from a main perspective, you know, we kind of dodged a bullet, but uh, not for the entire summer. So there's two big dates, um, the 15th and the 20th of July, where the wind patterns uh, really drove dispersing budworm down into Maine from that Quebec outbreak, uh, especially on the 20th here. So there's a lot of symbols on these um, maps here. Uh, most of them indicate unsuccessful or the end of a flight, you know, where the budworm has died or landed. But uh, the sun is, uh, you know, indicates that that's the only thing that ended the flight, you know. So they were successful during their nightly migration. Um, and they were, you know, these are, these are live insects that have touched down here versus, you know, dead insects that have been killed along the way and stuff like that. So really big influx of, of budworm into Maine and... Uh, yeah, we have a very extensive monitoring program and for sure they showed up, you know, that's just from one trap there in my hand. And yeah, I forget how many thousands of, of budworms I counted uh, this this past fall, but it was a lot. <laughs> so, and here's what our trapping network looks like. So uh, there is a pheromone lure that we can use for budworm that's quite effective. So uh, you can see the uh, intensification here from 2018 to 2019 here. So 
again, a lot going on. You can see the older maps on the on the website there going back to 2014 or 15 in this style. But uh, again, just a huge um, ramp up of, uh, of trap catches there. And you can see, you know, how that intersects with those flight models where we know we had a huge influx of uh, spruce budworm into, uh, into northern Maine. So, and yeah, we caught budworm, you know, and in places down east that you don't usually expect it, you know, to some degree as well. So uh, really, uh, really interesting. And we monitor light traps, and those light traps are monitored daily. So light traps that we had in the down east region caught spruce budworms on those, you know, particular days, and they didn't catch them the rest of the season. So it really shows that those, uh, those line up well with those freight models. Um, we also monitor uh, in partnership with the uh, University of Maine um, the overwintering larval um, <clears throat> budworm as well. So uh, basically you go out and collect branch samples and then uh, we send these to Canada to the Canadian Forest Service Healthy uh, Forest Partnership and, and, and a group, that group to, uh, to process for overwintering larvae. So they force them to emerge and they can count them. So here you can see where we actually recovered larvae from um, uh, branch samples in northern Maine. So these are the areas of concern again. Um, numbers are still relatively low, you know, with nothing getting over four there. Just for reference, once you get to about seven, that's where you would start considering management and seeing more noticeable defoliation. So the numbers are still low. Um, we did a second round of sampling that was all kind of waylaid by uh, the ability of the Canadian lab to uh, to process them based on, you know, lab shutdowns due to the, the ongoing pandemic and things like that, unfortunately. So we're waiting to see what those reveal. But um, fortunately, yeah, um, again, those those pheromone traps just show that the adults have shown up here, have been um, recovered, but the, uh, you know, the larval sampling gives a better indication of what's actually going to be present going into the 2020 season. And this would be what would actually cause defoliation here. So um, that's it for the insects. I always ask our pathologist if he wants me to slip in anything here from the pathology side. So he gave me a couple quick talking points that I'll mention. So uh, many of you have probably seen this. This is, you know, certainly statewide and uh, kind of region-wide in, in New England and the Northeast here, but um, very prevalent here in Maine. So we've had noticeable needle damage for the, the last 12 consecutive years. You know, it was, uh, it was, documented before that, but very apparent for the last 12 years here. So there's a whole suite of uh, leaf or, or needle pathogens rather that are affecting the white pine here in Maine. So uh, yeah, there's, there's a lot of work being done on that now. There's been um, a management uh, guidelines produced by University of Maine there just recently in cooperation with uh, with our pathologists and some other folks. So uh, that's available for, for folks to look at. Um, not just the white pine, unfortunately, red pine uh, continues to be pretty se severely affected in the Northeast as well, you know, not just Maine, but um, other places as well. Um, here in Maine, it looks like particularly um, one of the major problems are some of the shoot blights, so Diplodia and Syracaucus, very common shoot blights that are uh, affecting uh, red pine here in Maine. Um, we have some ongoing assessment uh, for that, so we have 25. Uh, stands you know with plots in them where we're, we're monitoring so we know that the plodia is present in almost all of them and syracaucus in most of them um, one of the uh the pieces of the puzzle that we're still trying to figure out and again this is popping up all, all over new england and other states as well as maine but uh it's the role of red pine scale so uh red pine scale was was first discovered on mount desert island in uh in 2014 and then there's been some some subsequent uh, detections, but some of those have come recently there, Hancock Point, Gouldsboro, and also we suspect it in Sorrento there, so, you know, due east um, of uh, Mount Desert Island. So it's a very small insect. We know it's uh, it's wind dispersed or capable of being wind dispersed, so that kind of points to that. So, uh, yeah, some affected stands, uh, we do find red pine scale in, some we do not, um, and the same for other states. It's not very consistent, but uh, there there appears to be possibly some association, so we continue to try and figure out what that might be um, as we go forward here, but certainly something we're monitoring more and more now. Um, 
One thing I'll mention here, you know, something that's uh, on our radar um, in the Northeast, the closest known location is New York, um, but um, that doesn't mean it couldn't be present in Maine, you know, again, something that's possible to be spread by humans, but that's oak wilt. So um, it's basically a, a really um, nasty vascular wilt fungus, kind of analogous to uh, what Dutch elm disease does to, to, uh, to elms, but um, particularly lethal to red oaks, and it can really uh, work quickly. You know, it can kill a red oak in, in as little as a month. Um, the white oak group fares a little better, but yeah, uh, northern red oak and the other species in the red oak group uh, tend to be uh, killed a lot quicker due to the differences in the, uh, the anatomy of their, their vascular system and uh, vessels and things like that. But uh, anyways, uh, it's kind of an interesting disease. It's spread two ways. Um, it's spread directly tree to tree um, through underground root grafting. And then uh, the, the, the vector we worry about that we can kind of influence is uh, our sap beetles. So sap beetles, as the name implies, feed on sap of various trees. So uh, any wound on an oak that's uh, producing any sort of sap in response to a, a wound uh, will be attractive to those beetles. And um, you know, the spore pad of the fungus is actually designed to be attractive to those beetles. It smells uh, a little bit fruity. And, um, you know, if they're covered in spores after foraging on that spore pad, and then they go to a fresh wound on another oak, that's basically how it's, it's spread above ground. So uh, we really discourage pruning of uh, oaks right now in the active growing season and uh, prefer that folks stay with that for late fall and winter uh, to avoid those open wounds that might be attractive to beetles. Um, symptoms to watch out for, and you know, again, we, we look to the public a lot to, uh, to report anything suspicious they're seeing, but basically um, this pretty distinct leaf coloration, it won't look like that, it's always variable, but basically this coloration from the margins inward, you can see the uh, interior leaf there is still green and healthy looking. Um, but um, yeah, and then also rapid leaf drop during the, the middle of the growing season there. So, you know, if you're working on your, your lawn and you see an abundance of uh, oak leaves in the middle of uh, the season there that shouldn't be there, that's, uh, that's something to look out for. And uh, yeah, particularly devastating disease to oaks. You can see the distribution of it. Um, like I mentioned, the closest thing in the Northeast is a satellite infestation in the Troy area of, uh, of New York there, but not too far away from Maine, you know, if we're talking about human transport. Um, but uh, yeah, it continues to expand its range in the core area. This is a picture from uh, aerial uh, survey in Minnesota. As you can see, you know, it's not just a forest pest, you know, quite uh, active, maybe even worse in these suburban environments where there's, you know, frequency of, of, of active wounds on oak trees from pruning activities and things like that. But um, yeah, just something to keep in mind. And uh, let us know if, if you see. And with that, that's 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 what I have for you. So I'm happy to uh, take any questions at this point. I saw a flash, so something might have come in in the, the chat box that I missed. Oh, that was from me. Just, okay. just letting everybody know that uh, if uh, you need to leave, that's fine. Um, Mike, I assume that uh, you will be happy to take um, questions after on email. And yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't have a timer on here. So if I went yeah, over, I apologize. Great stuff. And actually, I'm fine with continuing. I uh, just want to give people permission to leave if they have to. Um, but you will, uh, you're available on email. So for those who have to leave, but can't ask their question today, you can certainly Yeah. Oh, there I am. Um, um, m um, at main.gov. Is that right? Michael dot Paricio at main dot gov. Yes. Got that. Yep. And I will have that. Uh, I'll send an email out to everybody with uh, your contact information because I, you, you had a, a great stuff and I think the slides were terrific. <laughs> so Thank you. I'll have that. Yeah. Thanks. But you, you're still here. If anybody's got questions, please. I've here. got nowhere to go. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> So jump in if you want to. Just turn on your turn your mic on and go ahead and ask. This is, this is Richard. Can I ask a question? Sure. Sure, Richard. Go ahead. Uh, early on, we talked about you replaced uh, uh, the person that. So my, my question is, what is the 
How many people are working as entomologists at Forest Service now? What's the hierarchy so, over there? So. The hierarchy. So Allison Canody, who I replaced, uh, she was promoted to a state entomologist following Dave Struble's retirement. So Dave retired. Um, so Allison's in charge of the ship here. Um, we have myself, Tom Schmelk, Colleen Teerling are the other entomologists. And then Aaron Bergdahl is our staff pathologist. And then we have a whole network of uh, other field techs and, and conservation aides and things like that. Great, thank you. It gets confusing sometimes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, well, with, yeah, there had been a lot of turnover there. Hopefully we'll be, uh, we'll be pretty stable. Tom, uh, but yeah, well, I guess Aaron's got three or four years and, uh, you know, so relatively new. And then Tom started the year before and I got a year in. So yeah, relatively uh, fresh group, but hopefully we'll be stable now for a while and there won't be a, a lot of more turnover. Anybody else? Everybody got everything I said like that? <laughs> it was a lot of stuff in there. It was I dense. Do think, I do think that slideshow, if you'll send that to me, Mike, I'll, I'll have that posted with our with this recording on our website. It's Certainly. Full of information. How often does that get updated? Um, Is that yearly? It, it's based, no, no, it's basically, you know, this was, uh, I missed updating that one slide. I, I missed the header, but uh, no, that's freshly updated for this talk. So uh, basically, you know, it's the same core set of slides, but those maps are changing pretty frequently now. So uh, yeah, as soon as those uh, get updated, they go in. I, I like to keep the old maps in too for comparison, so you can kind of tell that way. But um, this one is uh, up to date for, for March 2020. Or, uh, we're in May, May 2020. Mm -hmm. Right. A lot of those maps were updated. Yeah, the big updates, yeah, came in, in March for the uh, um, EAB zone and the HWA zone, so. Great. Well, um, again, I've, I will have, uh, I'll send an email out with Mike's contact information and um, we'll have this uh, information on our website and I really appreciate you doing this for us and we'll have you back. My uh, pleasure. Yeah, let me know. Yeah, we would certainly um, make this available again. And because uh, it does seem like it's uh, changing pretty fast and the seasons, yep. it depends on the season as well. Yeah, and we're just getting into field season right now. So there's not a lot of excitement yet, but uh, within the next month, there'll probably uh, be quite a bit. So Great. I would encourage everybody to participate in the bark peeling. I did it in the first, maybe the first round, maybe three or four years ago, okay. right in the middle of it, and uh, expected it here and it wasn't there. So we peeled, spent all day up at the your facility just outside of Augusta peeling logs and uh, didn't find anything from the stuff that we brought up there. Three years later, uh, I brought, we had three samples from Acton. They all had emerald ash borer in it and we peeled it uh, with the facility. Yeah, that that goes to show. Yep. So if anybody has the chance to do it, it's, it's a fascinating process. Yeah, well, Colleen's working on getting, you know, volunteers for the, the network and then based on, you know, where people volunteer and how many we have, you know, sometimes we do have those larger peeling events in the uh, in the fall there. So, yeah, we'll uh, we'll advertise those if we're having public uh, participation for sure. I'll send the uh, link to the how to create a trap tree to monitor for EAB uh, from the Maine Forest Service website as well. That will be in the email I'll send out. Great. Great. Well, thanks again. Thanks everyone for attending. Love having you. And our next event will be uh, May 20th. Uh, we're going to have a benefits of land trusts uh, for your woodlot and specifically what is going on with our land trust since we are now hitting we've uh, we're getting close to 11,000 acres of of uh, preserve of a conserved land in our land trust so if you would like to see what else we have coming up go to our events page on our website mainwoodlandowners.org and uh, you'll see what we have coming up and we'll also have a june calendar up pretty soon as well we're going to continue doing this through june so again, thank you, and we will see everybody again at our next event.
Okay. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye.